Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Our YouTube channel. And in the video today, we're looking at whether there's really a fish that swims up your urine and into your bladder in the Amazon. If you've never heard of the Kandiru, also known as the pencil fish, the toothpick fish, the vampire fish, and the fish that swims into your pee hole, Google any one of those names, yes, even the last one, and you'll see hundreds of pages talking about this thing. It's a thin translucent fish that has a nasty habit of swimming up a stream of urine and lodging itself in the urethra of an unfortunate man or woman. The vast majority of these stories are from men though. On the surface, this perhaps makes sense as men have significantly longer urethras than women. 15 to 29 centimeters for men versus an average of only about four centimeters for women, making it a tad small for most Kandiru, which can grow as large as 40 centimeters, although they're usually only a few centimeters. Of course, the fact that there is a very large discrepancy here should be the first clue that this whole thing is a myth. After all, the Kandiri wouldn't know anything about the length of urethras and presumably would be just as attracted to a woman's as a man's, if at all. Luckily for us, the fish can't actually swim up your urine, which hasn't stopped people claiming it can and often does. One of the early accounts of this was in 1855 when Francis de Castelnau stated he was told by a South American fisherman not to pee in the water, even when standing outside of it, because the fish in question springs out of the water and penetrates into the urethra by ascending the length of the liquid column. First things first, according to all known laws and rules of fluid dynamics, swimming directly up a stream of human urine is impossible. A few naysayers in the comments are going to bring up the salmon as a counter to that point, which as we all know is totally capable of making it up waterfalls. For those people, it's important to first note that although salmon can swim against a strong current, when it comes to waterfalls or indeed any vertical obstacle, they jump. And let's be honest, because if there was a fish out there capable of leaping directly into your penis, we'd have dropped a bomb on it the second its Wikipedia article had been finished. As for swimming up your urine stream, not only would the fish have to stay entirely within the stream of urine, fighting against both the force of falling water and gravity, but it would also need the stream to remain intact for the entire journey, which would have to be pretty quick. We don't want to get into too many details, but fellas, if you're able to produce a stream of urine thick enough for a fish to swim up it, you're just tempting fate because the script for this video was written by a guy with the last name Smallwood. So if the Kandiru can't straight up boss its way up a stream of your urine while you're taking a whiz, surely that leaves it simply waiting for you to submerge your giggle stick in the water so it can get in that way, right? Well, luckily for everyone watching this, this too is very, very unlikely. When Kandiru expert and possible hero Dr. Stephen Spot was asked what the odds of a Kandiru lodging itself in your nine iron were, he responded quite flatly, about the same as being struck by lightning while simultaneously being eaten by a shark. Now admittedly, our math might be a little off here, but we think that ranks as being pretty unlikely. So where does this rumor come from? While there are references of this as far back as 1829, in that case from biologist C.F.P. von Martius, who was told of this happening by natives, the myth saw its biggest surge in popularity thanks to a book written in the 1930s aptly called The Kandiru by Dr. Eugene Goudar. In it, Goudar, like von Martius before him, recounted old tales from South American fishermen, even though said tales were often third-hand accounts of the stories and no person and interviewed had actually witnessed this. It should be noted that he also wrote an article in 1930 published in the American Journal of Surgery outlining why he was skeptical this fish could actually do what natives said it could, namely swim up your urine into your urethra. In terms of the tales themselves, it's largely believed these were either exaggerated or some researchers speculate were the result of piranha attacks. As the locals could probably tell the difference between Kandiru and the very different looking piranha, another more likely explanation is kidney stones, which as anyone unfortunately to have had them will tell you is about the worst pain a human can experience. On that note, there are reports from the Amazon that natives would drink a tea made from the fruit of the kawa tree to dissolve the skeleton of the fish. According to the Yearbook of Urology, printed in 1944, the tea really is effective at combating kidney stones. 
Given that the fish in question is translucent and small, one can see how these people might become convinced it was the fish getting into their bodies that was causing the skeleton. The one real piece of modern evidence that suggests a kandiru could actually lodge itself in your baby maker comes from a single case in 1997. The case, which involved one Dr. Samad, is the only known instance in which a kandiru has supposedly been removed from a human male. The case does seem fairly legit, since the surgery to remove the fish was not only widely covered, but was filmed and photographed too. In this case, the victim in question claimed the kandiru jumped out of the water and into his urethra as he was standing up to his knees in the water while peeing. However, although the story was widely reported and is still often quoted on shows about people surviving weird injuries, in which Dr. Samad himself still appears, the corpse of the fish itself was never officially recognized as a kandiru, and medical opinion from doctors, not trying to get on TV, agree that it was either a hoax or that the entire legend about the fish is a myth. In fact, the aforementioned biologist Dr. Stephen Spott went down to Brazil to investigate the event two years later and found many of the claims and evidence presented highly suspicious, not the least of which was the claim that the fish jumped out of the water and swam up the urine stream into the urethra, which simply isn't possible based on fluid dynamics. But wait, there's more. The fish that was supposedly taken from the man's urethra was 11.5 millimeters in diameter. For your reference, a typical male's urethral opening is only about 6 millimeters. While it's certainly possible to make it expand to allow such fish to enter, the fish would have had to propel itself with some pretty amazing force to make this happen by itself. Such a force it couldn't have generated by leaping out of the water, nor from swimming up a stream of liquid that was likely thinner than the fish itself. Of course, there's always the chance that Dr. Samad was telling the truth, and that one unlucky sod really did have his day ruined when a fish jumped out of the water and swam into his love gun. I mean, people do win big ticket lotteries, it's just extremely unlikely given the known facts of the case. Further, contrary to popular belief, Kandiru is not attracted to human urine. In fact, a study done in 2001 by Dr. Stephen Spott et al. showed that the primary way the fish looks for hosts is, in fact, by looking, oddly enough, using their eyes. And while many a man might think his penis is selfie-worthy, I'm guessing that the average Kandiru isn't so impressed that it feels compelled to jump out of the water to take a closer look. Now, all of that said, for the ladies out there, we've got some bad news. While there has never been a documented instance of a kandiru lodging itself in a woman's urethra, there have been a few credibly documented instances of them lodging in vaginas. However, in this case, while no doubt horrifying, it's a fairly simple matter to get the fish out, such as in 1891 when Paul Leconte removed one from a vagina by simply pushing it forward slightly, turning it around, and pulling it out. You push forward and turn it around first so the spines lie flat, rather than cause a bit of damage, as they would if you just pulled it out backwards. Bonus fact. The slinky was invented by accident when its creator, marine engineer Richard James, was working at a shipyard designing a device to measure horsepower output on naval battleships. The device required special springs for stabilization, one of which James accidentally knocked off his desk. It fell on a pile of stacked books and then continued onto the floor in a slinky-like fashion. After playing around with it a bit, Richard thought this would make a pretty good toy and got a loan to have several hundred slinkies made and packaged. He then managed to get his invention on the shelves of a local store. No one bought one for several days. Things changed when he went to the store and demonstrated the toy to people as they shopped, resulting in the whole stock selling out within two hours, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I really hope you enjoyed that video and hopefully we debunked what seems like an ongoing rumor. If you really did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also over there on the right, a couple of other videos you'll probably enjoy if you enjoyed this one, and thanks for watching.